It's a great honor to be with President Kagame. And we have uh, had tremendous uh, discussions on Rwanda. The job they've done is uh, absolutely terrific. We have trade with Rwanda. Uh, and just general, I would say, great relationships. Uh, I want to congratulate you, Mr. President, uh, as being the new head of the African Union. That's a great honor. This was just announced recently, and uh, that really truly is a great honor. So please give my regards. I know you're going to your first meeting very shortly. And please give my warmest regards. But it's an honor to have you as a friend. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Well, it was a great honor to meet uh, the President of the United States, uh, President Donald Trump. And uh, we had good discussions uh, on those two levels. Uh, the, bilateral relations uh, between Rwanda and the United States. Rwanda has benefited tremendously uh, from the support of the United <coughs> States in many areas where it is in peace support operations we have carried out in different parts of the world. We had the United States on our side supporting us. We have supported our economy in trade, investment. We see a lot of uh, uh, Tourists from the United States, visitors sure. coming to Rwanda, and the uh, President, I wanted to thank you for uh, the support you have received from you personally and the administration. And uh, we are looking forward to also working with the United States at the level of the African Union, where we are carrying out reforms at the African Union so that we get our act together to do the right things. and. That helps in cooperating with the United States. Uh, it would be more beneficial when we are organized to know what we want from the United States sure. for that cooperation. So I thank you very much. Well, I thank you very much. And it's a great honor to have all of you here. And uh, we'll speak for a little bit longer. And thank you very much. Thank you. We have our final rally in London. It's good to be here tonight in the Midlands. And thank you to everyone for attending. These hustings are for us, the volunteers of the Conservative Party, to take part in a great exercise of democracy where we get to choose our new leader. She or he will be announced on the 5th of September, so not long to go now, and as we're the party of government, then we'll become Prime Minister very soon afterwards. As Ian Dale, who moderated many of these hustings in 2019, said, I found chairing the hustings a surprisingly positive experience. The members really put the two candidates through their paces and asked some very searching questions. So I ask you tonight to make your questions searching, to make them succinct, and to ask questions and not to make statements, so that more of the audience have an opportunity to grill our candidates. Both of our candidates have a duty and a desire to fulfill our 2019 manifesto. Their differences will be about how to go about achieving that in a very different world from 2019, post-Brexit, post-Covid, in uncertain times internationally, look at the Ukraine and Taiwan, and where our union as a nation is being challenged. So I'm sure that tonight you'll want to test our candidates, to seek to establish their strengths, and to see who you think is best capable of running our great country. And I know that as all of us are Conservatives here tonight, you want to be respectful of our two candidates and keep your questions positive. There are now under two weeks left to vote. If you haven't already voted, then I ask you to vote online or by post. And it's very easy to vote online. Or you can choose traditional snail mail. But if you do post, then please remember to put a stamp on the envelope and that there's planned postal strikes this weekend, so voting online is the way to go. You should all by now have received your ballot paper. If you haven't, then please contact your constituency office, who will be able to help you. So tonight my hope is that you'll be given more clarity about how to cast your vote. I hope that you'll go away enthused and energised in your commitment to helping our great party win the next election. We need your support. Finally, I want to remind everyone that at the end of our democratic process, we must come together as a party.
We have many new members who should be contacted and made welcome. We have members return, returning to the fold, and we must make use of their talents. Ours has to be a combined effort under our new leader to go forward to victory at the next election. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, let's get on with the show. Please welcome Andy Stevenson, co-chairman of the Conservative Party. Thank you, Peter. Hello, Birmingham. Hello. And hello to Times Radio listeners tuning in to our West Midlands hustings. Anyone who watched last month's Commonwealth Games knows that you all here can put on a show. And at least in this contest, there's no chance of you being beaten by the Australians. <laughs> Tonight is another event where you, our members, have the chance of putting your questions to our two great candidates running to be the next leader of our party. Our hard-working party staff and myself are remaining impartial during this contest. The choice is yours, but we stand ready to unite behind whoever you choose as our next leader. That's what I've heard since my appointment as party chairman six weeks ago, meeting with party activists up and down the country. Including here in the West Midlands, where so far I've been out campaigning with Nicola Richards and Sean Bailey in West Bromwich. Yeah. Marco Longhi and Mike Wood in Dudley. Yeah. Jonathan Gullis, Jack Brereton and Joe Gideon, all in Soap on Trent. Yeah. Aaron Bell in Newcastle on the Line. Yeah. Eddie Hughes in Walsall. Yeah. Jane Stevenson in Wolverhampton. Yeah. And Wendy Morton in Aldridge. They are just some of the fantastic 42 hard-working Conservative MPs you helped get elected here at the last general election. And I want to see them all re-elected at the next general election. Which by uniting behind your choice for our next leader, we can achieve. Just as you helped get the amazing Andy Street back in as the Mayor of the West Midlands last year. Yay. And your choice, whoever you choose, will be a brilliant leader. Both have shown their qualities in government, demonstrating the drive and talent needed to do the hardest job in Britain. They will take us forward together, continuing the work done by our Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, who has shown that a Conservative government can rise to the challenges of today. Getting Brexit done, delivering the fastest vaccine rollout in Europe, protecting over 14 million jobs during the pandemic, and leading the world in supporting Ukraine and standing up to Putin. It's a truly historic record on which our new leader can build. The alternative, of course, is Labour. A party that voted against tax cuts for low-income families, against additional investment in our NHS, against protecting our borders and tackling the vile people smugglers. Would Labour have ever got Brexit done? If Sir Keir Starmer had his way, we'd still be fighting a second EU referendum. And the only way he can enter Downing Street is by promising Nicola Sturgeon a second one on Scottish independence. Birmingham, you deserve better, and so does Britain. It is our next leader who will continue to deliver for the British people, leading the way in standing up for our, our ideals and our partners on the world stage, uniting the country and this Conservative Party. And on that note, let me finish by thanking Times Radio, our partner for tonight's hustings, and handing over to your host for this evening, John Pina. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Lovely to see you all out there this evening. It is, it is such a, a, a pleasure, as well as an enormous privilege, to be here as the, the host for the business end of this evening's, this evening's events. And let me also send a big welcome to a Times Radio listeners, the audience listening to every word that I'm speaking and that's going to be spoken from this stage of the course of the next, the next couple of hours. And, and I mention that because I want to mention 
and welcome our valuable audience, but also as a reminder of the significance of this event, as if you needed reminded. You are not just in the course of these remaining two weeks of the campaign choosing your party leader. You're choosing our prime minister, which puts you in a position of enormous, enormous uh, power, I suggest a certain amount of, of privilege. A, a former leader of your party, uh, I once said, just to paraphrase slightly, never has so much been owed uh, by so many to so few. Now, the time will tell just exactly what you are owed for the decision you're going to be taking over over the next couple, uh, couple of weeks. But you have a remarkable, extraordinary responsibility on your hands, a role to, uh, to play. And I'm interested at this very, very early stage of the evening, because I hate to let a, an audience go to waste on any, any occasion, but can I just ask in the hall, how many of you have already cast your votes? Okay, well, I mean, there's quite a few still left to play for. Rashid and, and Liz, you've still got a game to play here, here this evening. And uh, I'll now say, let us get on with it. I'm looking forward to what's following in the course of the next couple of hours. I hope you are too. And I very, very much hope that we can, uh, between us, play a constructive and useful role at what is an incredibly important time in the life and the politics of our country. So let me now then get on with it and hand over straight away now to the, the candidates, the campaigns on either side of this Conservative Party leadership contest. I'll be talking to you again shortly. Thank you very much indeed. Please welcome Chancellor of the Exchequer, Nadine Zahari. Thank you very much and good evening, Birmingham. What a great privilege. It is uh, for me to be here tonight on home turf. Um, we should be under no doubt, friends, that these are tough economic times. There is a war on our continent, and Vladimir Putin is using energy as a weapon in that war. Specifically, it is a way of attacking the people of this great country for the help that we are providing the brave people of Ukraine, who will look tomorrow, tomorrow celebrate their cherished National Independence Day, and we will celebrate with them. We have come together tonight, and we must stay together to weather the storms of high energy costs and inflation, and of course, hold our nerve through this winter. That is the United Kingdom doing our bit in this war. Every bit as important as providing the military support and training to our Ukrainian brethren. This country led the world in our response to the illegal invasion of Ukraine. And tonight, I have the privilege of introducing the woman who is at the forefront of that response, our Foreign Secretary, took on the difficult task of sanctioning the oligarchs, of going after Putin's cronies and standing up to his ministers, and I am proud to be supporting her tonight. I have seen the extent of the challenges that our country is facing, my friends. I know that tough decisions are needed to protect hard-working families and businesses here in the West Midlands and, of course, across our country against inflation. But now that I have my feet under the desk in number 11, I have also seen firsthand that more of the same is not an option. As we go into the final stretch of these hustings, we need to come together quickly, just as we did in that vaccine rollout, and of course deliver for our great country. The British people expect us to fix the NHS backlog. They expect us to make our streets safer with police focused on tackling serious crime and use our freedoms to unleash business and growth. We need to win the next election and we need to win against both Labour and the Lib Dems. And of course, Liz Truss is the candidate that can unite the party, unite the country against Putin and win that next election for us. I came to this country at the age of 11, fleeing Saddam Hussein. 
Britain has given me everything, and I don't take the task of choosing its next Prime Minister lightly, nor should you. But never, never have I been more certain that I'm making the right choice. Liz is decent, honest, hardworking, and above all, understands the economics of growth. She does what she says she will do. That is why she has my vote. Thank you. The United Kingdom is a great country, and I know that the United Conservative Party can unleash the potential of all the people who make our country so great. To win the next election, we need to deliver, deliver, and deliver for the British people. I know that our country's best days lie ahead. I'm a candidate with a clear vision for the future who can drive change and get things done. As Trade Secretary, I'm negotiating deals with allies like Australia and Japan, creating opportunities around the world for British business. And as Prime Minister, I will continue to deliver on the opportunities of Brexit. I will lead a government committed to core Conservative principles, low taxes, a firm grip on spending, driving growth in the economy, and giving people the opportunity to achieve anything they want to achieve, regardless of their background. I will work day and night to lead a party in government that puts more money in your pocket and secures a better life for you and your family. I've consistently delivered when I have said I would. And I love our country. I want the best for us all. And I'm the person to do that. Please welcome Liz Truss. Conservative background. I grew up in Paisley in Scotland and in Leeds, where I went to the local comprehensive school. And what I saw at my school is I saw children who were let down. They were let down because of low expectations, because of their background. They were let down because of Leeds City Council, caring more about political correctness than making sure all children learnt English and maths. And they were let down because of a lack of opportunity in the area. And I thought that was an appalling waste of talent. And I wanted things to be different. That's why I went into politics. I want everybody across our great country to have opportunity, regardless of their background. I want us to be an aspiration nation. And that is what our fantastic mayor, Andy Street is delivering here in the West Midlands. He's delivered on the fantastic Commonwealth Games and it was great to visit a few weeks ago. He's delivered on the trams and the metro. And he has delivered investment, growth and business into this fantastic part of the country. And what I want to do as Prime Minister is I want to help him and all of our brilliant MPs across the Midlands deliver more for people and open up those opportunities and that aspiration. But the reality is we face difficult economic times. We have the war in Ukraine, we have the energy crisis, and we have the aftermath of COVID. And we've had several decades in this country of low economic growth. So we do need to be bold, and we do need to do things differently. We can't just have more business as usual. We need a plan for growth. And that is what I would deliver as your Prime Minister. First of all, I will unleash the opportunities of Brexit. We need to get all of the EU law off our statute books by the end of 2023. Yeah. And that means that means that we will unleash investment into cities like Birmingham, towns and cities across our country. We can do more trade deals, benefiting industries like ceramics, industries like the car industry. And I had a great visit 
earlier to JLR, industries like financial services and technology. But we also need to cut tax. I would reverse the national insurance increase. The fact is we didn't need to increase national insurance. We can still afford to pay off the debt, uh, start paying off the debt after three years. I'd also have a moratorium, a temporary moratorium, on the green energy levy to immediately save people money off their fuel bills. Yeah. And I'd, I'd keep corporation tax low. Because if we raise our corporation tax to the same level as France and 10 points higher than Ireland, we won't attract that new investment into this part and other parts of our country. And I fundamentally believe, as Conservatives, we need to be on the side of people who work hard and do the right thing. The self-employed, the small businesses, commuters who go into work every day, that's who side we are on. And I would legislate to make sure essential services are being provided, like our railway services, and we stop the militant trade unions disrupting our country. Now, before I was a member of Parliament, I joined the Conservative Party back in 1996. I was a party activist, and I was also a local councillor. And as a local councillor, I sat on the planning committee. And I'm afraid to say, I'm afraid to say those are hours of my life I will never get back. <laughs> because we were overruled by the planning inspectorate in Bristol, all the top-down housing targets. So I would immediately abolish the top-down targets in the planning bill coming up in the level of And I would level up in a conservative way by creating new low-tax investment zones with the support of local MPs, local mayors, bringing investment into our country. And what I would also do is change the Treasury rules about investment. So we're putting more investment into the areas that don't have it already, not the areas that do have it already. <laughs> and I would also back our fantastic farmers. I want our farmers producing food, not filling out forms, and I want our fields full of crops and livestock, not full of solar panels. <laughs> to stand up to Vladimir Putin in Ukraine. I'm proud that we were the first European country to send weapons to Ukraine. And I, as Foreign Secretary, put the toughest sanctions regime on Russia of any country in the world. But we cannot be complacent about our security. We need to make sure that we are increasing our defence at this insecure time. And I would raise defence spending to 3% of GDP by the end of the decade. And I will also crack down on illegal immigration. I supported the, I, I supported and worked with Priti Patel on the Rwanda scheme. We need to make it work and we need to expand it to more countries. And what I would do is legislate to make sure our decisions about our borders cannot be overruled by the ECHR. But as well as freedom and democracy around the world, we also need it here in Britain. We need free speech and we need to push back against the identity politics of the left. speaking Yorkshire woman. And I know that a woman is a woman. And I will, I will make sure that we protect our single sex spaces like domestic violence shelters. I'll also stand up for the United Kingdom. I travel around the world. People respect us. They respect the role we have played in democracy and freedom. But there are too many people in Britain trying to talk our country down, saying we should somehow be ashamed of our past, that our best days are behind us. I don't agree with those people. Our best days are ahead of us. And we can see, we can see what's happening here and how 
Andy Street is turbocharging and moving forward Birmingham. And in 2019, you know, we won swathes of seats right across the Midlands. Places like Stoke-on-Trent, West Bromwich, Dudley North. People voted for us not because they wanted their Labour Party. They were fed up with the Labour Party. They were fed up with the Labour Party letting their area down. What they wanted is conservative values. Personal responsibility, low taxation, enterprise and opportunity in their area. And that's what we have to deliver. We have to get those spades in the ground. We have to deliver on what we promised in 2019. And I'm somebody that gets things done. I don't take no from an answer. And at the Department of Trade, I delivered dozens of trade deals where people said it wouldn't be possible. At the Foreign Office, I delivered the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill to Parliament through Whitehall. We got the consent of the House of Commons. I'm prepared to, to get things done and take the tough decisions. And that's what we need. And that's what I will do. I will unleash the potential of our great country if I am elected as your Prime Minister. I will stand up against Keir Starmer, yet another Labour leader, yet another Labour Party politician who doesn't believe in opportunity and doesn't believe in aspiration. And I will help us and I will make sure, working with you, that we win the next general election and we keep the West Midlands blue. Thank you. This class perhaps being full of beans. And we'll find out between us in the course of this, this coming session whether this class and whether Rishi Sunak are equally full of answers to questions. And what, went, what the, the Foreign Secretary was saying there clearly went down very well with a large section of this, of this hall. But I think you all know, because people listening to this live also know, there's a great deal we haven't heard from these contenders to be our Prime Minister about issues that affect millions of us at this extraordinarily difficult time. And hopefully in the course of the next couple of hours, we will make some progress on that as well. So let us now, without me taking up too much time at this stage, because I will be back and so with our candidates, let me carry on and hand over to the candidates. Please welcome the Member of Parliament of Sutton Coalfield, Andrew Mitchell. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to these hustings in Britain's second city, which has just dazzled the world with the most brilliant, the most successful Commonwealth Games ever held. And where we, in the royal town of Sutton Coalfield, were so proud to hold the triathlon. And as we come towards the end of these major regional hustings, please let me say, that both candidates to lead our party and our country as Prime Minister are brilliant. And don't you think, as we look back to the start of this contest, if you can remember that far back, and at the age of my colleagues who first stood for the leadership, that it is only the Conservative Party our party, which truly looks like and reflects the country which we seek to serve. And who can doubt that either of them would be a far better Prime Minister than Keir Starmer, who until recently was supporting Jeremy Corbyn to lead our country. Now, now in the 35 years since I was first elected to serve in the House of Commons, no leader of our country has faced such a daunting inheritance, nor acquired such courage, judgment and experience. It is as if all the threats and challenges of the last 50 years are being visited on us in one fell swoop. We face industrial disruption and an energy price hike 
with terrifying household costs. Interest rates and mortgage and rent rises. Warfare and crisis in Europe. And inflation, with the devastation it causes as it devalues us all. It was Mrs. Thatcher who said, Inflation is the parent of unemployment and the unseen robber of those who have saved. And that is all before the huge issues for our health service, which arise from the COVID crisis and its legacy. But ladies and gentlemen, it is not problems which defeat governments. It is the way we politicians and our leaders defeat those problems which determines our fate. And so it is in these circumstances that I choose to support Rishi Sunak, as do some of our most respected former party leaders, Michael Howard and William Hay, and, you may feel this is of particular significance, some of our most successful finance ministers, chancellors Nigel Lawson, Ken Clark, Norman Lamont and Peter Lilly. When faced with the unprecedented challenge of COVID and the massive threat to jobs and employment. It was Rishi Sunak who designed and implemented what the IMF described as the best furlough scheme in the world and ensured through his efforts that we protected the livelihoods of 14 million people and the future of one and a half million businesses. And so, as we head into an extraordinary and dangerous storm of frightening economic ferocity, it is Rishi Sunak who has shown by his deeds and his actions that he is the safe helmsman with the experience, record and judgment to weather these storms, to reach out across our divided society and to secure the results we need if we are to win the next general election. We need a Prime Minister of courage, judgment, decency and experience. That Prime Minister is Rishi Sunak. Thank you very much.
the best way that we spread opportunity, indeed the best way that we transform people's lives, is by ensuring that the birthright of every child is a world-class education. And that, and that in a nutshell, are my values. Patriotism, family, hard work, service. And I know as I saw you nodding that those are your values too. And that's because they're conservative values. And that's why I want to be your Prime Minister, to put those values into action to build a better Britain. Yay! But, how, but how are we going to do that? Well, we need to do three things. First, we must restore trust. Next, we need to rebuild the economy. And then, we need to reunite our country. Now, when it comes to restoring trust, for me, that starts with honesty. And as you can see in this leadership race, I have not chosen to say the things that people may want to hear. I have said the things that I believe the country needs to hear. And even though, and even though that doesn't make my life easy, it is honest, and for me, that is what leadership is all about. But we'll also restore trust by delivering on the things that matter to people. That's why I've set out a plan to start reforming the NHS so we can stop constantly thinking about throwing more money at it and more talk about the efficient healthcare that we're getting out of it. It's why I want to take on this lefty woke culture that seems to want to cancel our history, our values and our women. That's why I want to make sure that we keep our communities and streets safe. So it is remarkable that right here we have a Labour Police and Crime Commissioner who seems to be spending more of his time trying to find ways to make it easier for people to take illegal drugs rather than actually tackling crime. I tell you this, for me whether it comes to using things like stop or search or indeed tackling grooming gangs. I will never let political correctness stand in the way of keeping us safe. Yeah. And whether, whether, whether it is that Labour Police and Crime Commissioner, or indeed the shambles that is Sandwell Council, it just shows why we need Conservative, Conservative councillors, Conservative PCCs, and great Conservative mayors like Andy Street in charge. But it's also why I want to restore trust in our rural communities, like mine in North Yorkshire, like yours here, in Warwickshire and Staffordshire, Derbyshire and Nottinghamshire. And that means increasing our food security, protecting our agricultural land, and unequivocally backing British farmers. Yeah. And it's why, it's why I set out a detailed and radical plan to finally get to grips with illegal migration. Now I stand here as a product of our country's proud, compassionate history in welcoming people to our shores. But it must be done legally. It must be done fairly. And we, when we turn on our TV screens and see the scenes of people breaking the rules to come here, it undermines trust in the system and it is wrong and we must stop it. With my plan, we will, and we will get control of our borders. Now, when it comes to rebuilding the economy, you all know that the number one challenge is inflation. Inflation is the enemy. It makes everyone poorer. It eats into people's hard-earned savings, their pensions. It pushes up mortgage rents. Now, this autumn and winter, I will make sure that we support people with the cost of living. Not only cutting VAT on energy bills, but going further to help the most vulnerable in our society, like those on the lowest incomes and pensioners, because that is what a compassionate Conservative government must do at a time like this. <laughs> but what, what, ladies and gentlemen, what I will not do, what I will not do is pursue policies that risk making inflation worse and lasting far longer, especially 
if those policies amount to borrowing 50 billion pounds and putting it on the country's credit card and then asking our kids and our grandkids to pick up the tab because that is not right. Now I will, I will cut your taxes, but I will do it responsibly by being tough on public spending and by growing our economy. And that's why this autumn I'm going to radically change how we tax businesses in this country. Cutting taxes for those businesses that are doing the right thing, investing in expanding their production. Businesses that are innovating to create the products and services of the future because that is how you drive growth in a modern economy and the businesses that will benefit the most will be those manufacturing businesses right here in the Midlands. Now, but it's also, as someone, as someone who was proud to support Brexit, we need to make sure that we capitalise on it, and that means we must get on with cutting EU red tape. And as Chancellor, I've created a new Brexit policy of free ports and put one right here in the Midlands. It's why as Chancellor, I invested in new institutes of technology here, transport infrastructure, in communities up and down, in Stoke, in Wolverhampton, in Dudley, in Mansfield and Ashfield. I was a Chancellor who delivered for the Midlands, and I will be a Prime Minister who continues levelling up here in the Midlands. Yeah. Because in two years, when it comes to reuniting our country, we have to do something that has never been done before. We have to make British political history by winning a fifth general election in a row. Now, even though that hasn't been done, I know that working together, all of us, we can do it. But it's going to require us to appeal to swing voters everywhere. Right here, in the north, in the south, in liberal areas and labour areas, in Remain areas, in Brexit areas, in urban areas and rural areas, in Wales and in Scotland, and I passionately believe, and the evidence suggests, that I am the candidate that offers our party the best opportunity of beating Labour and ensuring Keir Starmer never walks through the doors of number 10 Downing Street. And in conclusion, let me just say this. You saw me as Chancellor at the beginning of the pandemic acting radically to successfully safeguard our economy through the biggest economic storm in 300 years. Now, as your Prime Minister, I promise you, I will apply that same urgency and grip to every other aspect of government to build a better Britain. A Britain where our kids can walk safely on the streets at night. A Britain where the NHS is finally reformed and there for us when we need. A Britain where our schools and apprenticeships are the envy of the world in providing opportunity. And a Britain where our economy is the most dynamic it has ever been with our businesses investing and innovating to create jobs in every part of our country. But I also promise you this, perhaps more importantly, that I will give you my all to ensure that each and every one of you here tonight can always feel enormously proud of the Conservative government that I will be privileged to lead. So I humbly ask for your support, not just to be your next party leader, but also the next Prime Minister of our great country. Thank you. of that presentation, the, uh, the campaign videos, it was like watching a, a Hollywood opening uh, this, this evening. And so look, we'll carry on now, because as I mentioned earlier on, I think we know now a certain amount about these two contenders to be 
our Prime Minister. And I think no one in the hall can really deny it. There's an awful lot we do not know. An awful lot that we want to know. And that goes for people in this hall, in the Conservative Party, and the many, many more outside. So if I can do anything, and we can do anything between us, to make something of a, of, of a, of a dent in that, in that, in that, uh, that, that vacuum of information and, uh, and all of the rest of it. Let's have a look. I'm going to start now by welcoming, if you would, to the stage, Foreign Secretary, Contender for Prime Minister, Liz Truss. COVID, uh, by the war in Ukraine, and that is why it's so vital we stand up to Vladimir Putin. But we've got another issue that I would add to your list, John, which is the issue of low economic growth and the danger of a recession. And we know that a recession would carry a huge toll. And we also need to make sure the economy is growing. So we have multiple challenges that we face as a country. And this is why we have to be bold and I have set out a bold agenda of not just lowering taxes and helping people who are struggling. And I understand you know, there are problems with food bills, bills, with fuel bills, but also with the cost of living. We also need to make sure we grow the economy and we avoid talking ourselves into a recession. I think that's very important. Taxes are currently at a 70 year high and there is a current proposal to raise corporation tax which i believe would deter investment and make it harder for us to grow the economy so we have multiple challenges there will need to be a fiscal event as you rightly say and i've set out my priorities my first priority is reducing taxes because what i don't believe is taking money from people in taxes and then giving it back to them in benefits that is Gordon Brown economics and frankly, it has a work. And the second thing we need to deal with is supply, and in particular the energy supply. We haven't done enough to get gas out of the ground, to use our reserves 
to move forward with nuclear, to move forward with renewables. We need to get on with those things much quicker, as well as liberating other bits of supply of the economy. I talked in my speech about investment. You know, we need to do things like solvency too, so we liberate investment. So we need to deal with the supply. Now, of course, in any fiscal event, a chancellor has to look at the people on fixed incomes. And I've already committed to the triple lock for pensioners. I've already committed to a temporary moratorium on the green energy levy, which would take money off everybody's fuel bills. But as you rightly say, you know, we are not going to sit here today, John, and write, write the budget. But what I fear has been missing from the economic discourse is, first of all, dealing with growth and getting growth going. Because without growth, we are in an even worse position. I'm going to try and keep my questions short. I, I, I don't agree with you because you reasonably can. We've got a lot to get through in little time. It's your signature, signature policy of this uh, to, to carry out these, these unfunded tax cuts in the hope of stimulating growth. Your critics say that's a move to higher inflation, which would hurt everyone, including the worst. Off Michael Gove says you're on a holiday from reality. Can you give your critics an example, a clear example, of where a country has successfully grown its economy? through cutting taxes, because without that, aren't you inviting the country to join you on an experiment, an experiment with people's livelihoods and lives? Well, i give you the example of Britain, where we cut corporation tax and we saw revenues increase. There's an example of where cutting taxes actually helped us attract more revenue into the Treasury and more growth into the economy. And this, this whole language, John, of unfunded tax cuts, implies the static model, the so-called abacus economics that the Treasury orthodoxy has promoted for years. But it hasn't worked for our economy because what we've ended up with is high tax, high spending and low growth. And that is not a sustainable model for Britain's future. So what I want to... That orthodoxy, that Treasury government well, orthodoxy, sat... year after year after year. Well, uh, I sat in cabinet and I opposed the national insurance rights for precisely the reason. And I, uh, you know, I, I, I raised my issues internally. I've complained about plenty of these policies internally. But I respect collective responsibility and I was loyal throughout. But fundamentally, it was wrong to raise national insurance. We promised we wouldn't do it in our manifesto. We didn't need to do it. We could have funded the NHS costs out of general taxation. And that decision was taken. I think it's wrong because we now have the highest taxes in 70 years. We're talking about putting our corporation tax up to the same level as France. Last time I looked, France was not a low-tax country. We need to compete internationally. You know, we need businesses like JLR in Midlands to attract the investment in, to create those high-paid jobs. And you know, I can give you plenty of examples of economies of growth. You have invited out of your comparisons with Margaret Thatcher. In, in no, I, I haven't invited them. The media constantly go on about it. And look, but you, you know, welcome, I welcome the comparison. You know, as, Because there haven't been as many women leaders as men leaders. Yeah, I, I, That's the truth. But I don't think the same thing with a, a small state could say that Margaret Thatcher. She was a great leader of our country, and I'm proud of the way she turned out. And, 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 and that doesn't mean what we're facing now is the situation we're facing in 1979. It's a different situation, and we need different policies now. But the principles she believed in were the right principles. Enterprise, personal responsibility, giving people control over their own money, putting money back in people's pockets. Those are the principles I agree with. The, the tax burden was higher when Margaret Thatcher left office than it was when she took office. Now, you say your strategy can avert, your way avert, recession in this country. The Bank of England is predicting recession over the space of five courses starting this year. Are you saying you can stop that? You can roll that back? Because that is a huge promise and you'd be judged by it, by the other people. Well, what I'm saying is that a forecast isn't destiny. That we have the ability to change our own 
future by doing things differently. And this is why we need to be bold. And I see huge opportunities. You know, one of the things we're talking about here in the Midlands is the Gigafactory. That's an exciting opportunity. We need to attract that investment. You know, we're talking about huge things like life sciences, technology, financial services. We can unlock those opportunities. Now, I am not foolish enough to get out of the crystal ball and say, I can predict what the level of growth in the economy will be this year and next year. And by the way, nobody else can either. But what I know is putting up taxes to the highest level in 70 years will choke off that potential growth. That's what I know. I'm a conservative. I believe in low taxes. I believe in companies succeeding. I believe in companies making profits so that they are able to hire new workers and bring in investment. And that is what I believe, and that's the platform I'm standing on. So our public, our public services, you know, you some of this, our public services are suffering, well, in pretty much all cases, something of a staffing crisis. I can talk about health, I can talk about schools, but you'll have seen the, just the latest headline dominating the news today about the awful uh, crime in Liverpool, where an eight year old girl was killed by gunmen forcing their way into her home. What does that say? What would you say about that case? And what it tells you is, as someone pretending to be Prime Minister, about the need to strengthen law enforcement, providing more police officers in particular. You may tell me there's a promise for 20,000 more police officers. I would then tell you that's simply making up for the cuts in police numbers under Conservative rule. What do you say to reassure those people who want more done about crime? First of all, my thoughts go out to the family, and it's an absolutely appalling, appalling crime, an appalling um, murder, murder that, that took place in Liverpool. Yes, we do need to see more police on our streets. I mean, we do. It's about recruiting more officers, but it's also about making sure those officers are focused on the crimes we care about and the public care about. I would introduce the league tables so the public have a better way of looking at how their local force is performing. And you know, we need that change in the culture driven by you know, police and crime commissioners driven, driven from the top. You know, there is a serious problem in this country with gun crime. You know, there's a serious problem with gangs. There's a serious problem with knife crime. And I'm absolutely determined we get a grip of that. OK, let me ask you now about integrity in government. This is uh, spurred by a question from what about time video listeners who wants to know and suggest that there hasn't been enough said about the need to improve conduct in government given the grotesque circumstances of the fall of our present Prime Minister. Would you appoint an ethics advisor in place of the ethics advisor who's resigned after the previous ethics advisor who's resigned? And just as important, would you give that advisor the power to initiate investigations into misconduct whether you want that investigation or not? Well, first of all, I do think there need to be proper whistleblowing procedures. You know, I would put in place, if I was elected as Prime Minister, a strong chief whip. I would return them to number 12 Downing Street, so they, they are at the heart of government and making sure that there is zero tolerance for misbehaviour. But I do think one of the problems we've got in this, in this country and the way we approach things is you know, we have numerous advisors and independent bodies and rules and regulations. For me, it's about understanding the difference between right and wrong. And I'm somebody who has always acted with integrity. I have always you know, been clear about what I will do and follow through on my promises and been honest about the situation. And that is what I would do as Prime Minister. And I don't think you can outsource ethics. Well, well, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not necessarily saying that, but what I am saying is the leadership themselves, the Prime Minister themselves, needs to take responsibility. You cannot outsource ethics to an advisor. We need ethics running through the government. And it, and it starts, you know, the culture of organisations, John, starts at the top, and that's what's important to me. And of course, I would ensure that correct apparatus is in place so that people are able to you know, whistle blow if there are problems. But you know, if a leader is saying that they don't know the difference between right and wrong and they need to outsource it to an ethics advisor, I think that's a fundamental problem. Okay.
I'm going to slip one more in before I open questions to the, to the floor. I'm keen to get to that stage. Just, uh, just very briefly, that's fine. You're getting from another a reader of the Times who asked this question. We're all human beings. We all have our full flaws and our faults. What is the, the flaw, the fault in your character that you would like to address and improve? Um, I think some of my friends might say I'm a bit relentless. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is sometimes. That's about as much as I'm going to get on that. So um, I'm now going to lose my questions from the floor. I'm going to take to the podium and we'll take it from there. Now, I'm going to see if we've got arms up, up all around the room. So, gentlemen, in the blue shirt sitting close to us. Liz, um, this week, my, uh, me and some Conservative friends started the Conservative Tenants and Landlords Forum. And given the average millennial has moved uh, on average about 10 times, what would you do to reduce the number of unnecessary moves? And more broadly, what would you do for tenants and landlords? Well, first of all, uh, I think it is important that we support tenants and landlords and have a very clear rental market. And I also think it's important that we don't sort of drive landlords out of the market and we do make sure that you know, there are fair rules in place. But I also want to help more people who've been renting get onto the property ladder. So what I would want to do is enable people with good rental histories to be able to use those rental histories to get a mortgage, to help more people own their own home. And well, sir, are you satisfied by that answer? So it's like customer there is this are, are the young ladies sitting just in front of me? Hello Liz. Um, I share one thing with you in that I also grew up in Paisley, but uh, many years before you. I'm not sure about that. <laughs> we have now had a majority Conservative government for 12 years. And in those 12 years, the country seems to have got even less Conservative. We have, we've had to endure damaging wokery in academia, the civil service, and even the armed forces. What specific action would you take to put that right? Well, I think, I think we have achieved many things in our time in government. I'm proud of the education reforms that we delivered, which have improved schools. I'm proud of the welfare reforms that we've delivered that have got more people into work. But you are right. You know, there is an issue with the culture in our public services, not reflecting the views of the public. And you know, this is true when it comes to talking down our country, uh, which I'm concerned about, but it also is true when it comes to women's rights. And I've been very clear, for example, that I will make sure that single sex spaces are protected. And we can't have a situation where, you know, there are hospital wards that claim to be single sex that simply aren't, or we have domestic sh violence shelters where that's under question. But what it takes is it takes political leadership. And it takes a Prime Minister that makes that happen, but also ministers that make that happen in, in departments. And I think as Conservatives, some ha sometimes we've been afraid of making Conservative arguments. And we've allowed the left to dominate the social space. And I won't let, allow that to happen. I am prepared to make the argument. I am prepared to be difficult. I'm not prepared to make no for an answer. I'll get those things done. Three rows back at the end of the line. Yes, you sir, thank you. I think I might recognise that chap. He's a former colleague. Liz, I was the UK's first small business commissioner. There are six million small businesses in the UK. Um, I spoke to about 2,000 of them over the period of two years. And I have to tell you, they often feel unloved, overregulated, and overtaxed. What can we do to promote long-term business growth? Because that's the backbone of the UK economy. Well, Paul, Paul you, are, you are, of course, right. So first of all, reversing the national insurance increase will help small businesses that have been hit with extra employers' national insurance. 
We also need to look at the regulatory burden on businesses. I will conduct, or I would conduct, a full tax review, looking at things like business rates and how we make that much, much fairer for small businesses. But we also need to look at regulations and the regulatory burden. This is part of the point of getting all of those EU laws off the statute books by the end of 2023. Because it often isn't an individual law, it's just a combination of forms that businesses are asked to fill in and the hoops they're asked to jump through. And it's easy for a big business with a big HR department, with a big tax department, to do that work. It's very hard for small businesses, so I will absolutely make sure I'm cracking down on those regulations, but also we're not putting new regulations on small businesses. Some of our, some of our biggest businesses are formerly publicly in utilities, and there are questions and concerns about those. Let me just ask you briefly, very briefly, about one water industry. We're seeing daily reports now of pollution fouling our waterways and coastline of this of this country. And meanwhile, I think average bonuses to the bosses, to executives of the water companies, are at £670,000. That can't be right, can it? I do think there are problems with the way utilities are regulated. We were one of the first countries to regulate utilities and to privatise utilities. But the world has moved on since then. And what tends to happen over time is some of those regulators get mission creep. They don't necessarily keep the market as, you know, properly as they should. And I certainly think it's the case that water companies need to be better at stopping leaks. They need to be better at dealing with pollution. And we need to sort that out. So I do agree more action needs to be taken by the regulator. You, you cut funding to the Environment Agency, Liz. Was that a mistake? Well, I am a great believer in value for money from public services. And believe me, there are plenty of things the Environment Agency were doing that they shouldn't have been doing. And I was, I was very clear that... Uh, I'm sure there are a few people in the room that have experienced the activity of the Environment Agency. It's the responsibility of Ofwat, the water regulator, to be regulating on, on the way the water companies behave. That is Ofwat's responsibility, and we should be putting that pressure on them. I'm Penny Anne O'Donnell. I'm the voluntary director for CPF. How will you, in, thank you. Um, how will you ensure that your policy team regularly engages with the CPF and our 10,000 members with our great grassroots surplus policy ideas? And also, given your drive for an aspiration nation as a speech and language therapist, I'd like to ask: How will you ensure that education really is a lavish opportunity for our children to send? and reduce the adversarial tribunal culture around accessing the EHCP support that these children need. Mm -hmm. so, so first of all, you know, I joined the Conservative Party in 1996. I've been a Conservative activist for many years. I've been a councillor. And Conservative members have huge value to add, and we need to be using them more in government. I would appoint a strong single-party chairman who would show leadership on these issues, as well as making sure we are getting the policy feed in from the Conservative Policy Forum, and also the feedback. Because one of the mistakes I think we've made as a government is not listening enough to people on the ground. And I know, you know there's a huge amount of experience and common sense right across the Conservative Party. And I'm somebody who does engage with people and does talk to people, and I would absolutely commit to do that. On the issue of... Um, special educational needs. The system at the moment is pretty difficult for parents. And I speak to parents who say they feel like they're constantly battling the system. And actually, if you are looking after a child with special educational needs, you deserve help. You don't deserve to have to battle the system. So we do need to reform the system to make it much more responsive to people. I think family hubs a part of the solution to that. I think having more support in schools is part of the solution to that. But I agree with you. At the moment, we have created, I'm afraid, a nightmare for lots of parents who have to just battle the system. Yeah. 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 I have a on services, public services, before we take yeah. more, more questions. Given your plans to, to um, on national 
insurance. What will you do about the crisis? I don't think it's, a, it's too, uh, too much of a, a stretch to use that word about social care in this country. How would you solve the problems facing social care, which are truly immense? So I, I still would spend the money. I would just take it out of general taxation rather than raising national insurance. But I would spend that money in social care. The fact is quite a lot of it has gone into the NHS. I believe it should go to local authorities to deal with the very real issues in social care because the problem we've got at the moment is people are in beds in the NHS who would be better off in social care beds. So put the money into social care, free up more space in the National Health Service and empower the front line in the National Health Service because there are still too many central diktats going to the front line. People on the front line feel disempowered. You know, we're seeing increasing numbers of people leaving the profession. So those are the issues we need to deal with. These services are starved of funds now. The heart is speed that. You are proposing well, to cut sorry, do, we, we put these extra money in. We put the extra 13 billion in. And what people who work in the NHS tell me is the problem is the number of layers in the organisation they have to go through to get things done. The lack of local decision making. That's what people are telling me. That's what people are telling me is the problem rather than a lack of funding. Just put in the front row, sir. Good evening, Liz. Um, young people, um, you talk about youth violence, gang crime. And, um, we're working at 38 primary schools in the, in the region right now. Kids are at risk of getting involved in youth violence. What do you perceive to be the fundamental issues that are the root cause of those problems? And what would your government do to bring some transformation to those issues and change the lives of these young people? Well, you know, the work you do is very important. And you know, I think um, youth clubs, for example, like Youth Zone, are very important in giving young people alternative places to be rather than being prey to gangs. Um, I visited one very recently in London, um, so I'd like to see more of those. Some of those are funded by the private sector, others funded by the voluntary sector. I support schools opening for longer hours, actually, again to help, help children get the skills they need, but also to make sure that they are you know, less prey to potential alternatives. And I think it is all about early intervention. That is what it's about. It's about making sure the alternative is better for those young people and they have those opportunities. And that's why you know, these things which sometimes sound esoteric, like talking about economic growth, what it is about is about more apprenticeships, more jobs, more good opportunities for young people so they are not encouraged to go off in the wrong direction. as many as we can. Lady, second room. I was going to say I'm used to shouting. So, <laughs> I'm a cancer in Dudley. I'm actually the lead member for children's services there. So following on from my uh, these weren't planted questions, by the way. Um, we know that working white class boys are actually our most disadvantaged group. Uh, both you and Rishi have mentioned education, aspirations. Will you, as Conservative, bring back brown schools? Because that is the most important thing. Yes, I will allow new grammar schools, absolutely. Yeah. And I will also, I will also allow, allow new, new free schools as well. And I, you know, I'm a big fan of free schools like the Michaela School, uh, which is fantastic. And, and you know, we need to allow the good schools to expand and set up more branches right around the country. And I'm somebody who did go to a comprehensive school. My daughters now both go to grammar school. I want children all across the country to have those opportunities. But we also need to deal with primary school education. Because the fact is, 30% of kids are leaving primary school without basic English and maths. And it's very hard if you get to age 11 without that to be able to succeed in life. It just makes it a whole lot harder. You know, I'm proud of what I did in education. I removed calculators from the primary school tests so that all kids had to get the basics of mental arithmetic. But we need to do more. 
You know, we need more specialist teaching, particularly on maths in primary school. We need more early years support too, because the earlier we start, the better. Thank you. So I'm being, I'm being told time is, is pretty much. I'll ask you just before we get a question, which is as much about you, this class, as it is about the question of policy. So, and your character. And um, by the way, when it comes to uh, you, your personality, I did enjoy your interview with the Mail on Sunday newspaper quite recently, when you, you told the interviewer that you, whenever you see a mouse, there are lots of mice at the house, and you jump on a chair. Was, was that true? Or did you... that I'm not sure if that interview was recently, but I'm worried that somebody will get a mouse out now. I'm not, I'm not a mouse, <laughs> mouse, I have to say. Sure and there are a lady in the house of Commons, so I, I, I think we should have more cats. Most. More cats, more cats is the answer. And I'm very pleased there is a cat at number 10, so if I do become Prime Minister, at least I'll be mice free. Oh, which, which, what you see now is, is, I think, uh, too much of a man to carry mice around for the purpose of frightening uh, a rival. Now, look, here's another uh, question. One of the first things, I'm very briefly frank, one of the first things that will happen when if you, you become Prime Minister, you'll be ushered into a room very privately at number 10. Will be laid out in front of you what are called the lessons of last resort. Your orders to our tribe vote captain on whether you, Prime Minister Liz Trust, is giving the order to unleash our nuclear weapons. It will mean global annihilation. I won't ask you, would you press the button? You will say yes. But faced with that task, I would feel physically sick. How does that thought make you feel? I think it's an important duty of the Prime Minister, I'm ready to do that. I'm, I'm ready to do it. That's, that's right. So Liz Truss, thank you for those answers. Ladies and gentlemen, Liz Truss. So that was uh, reasonably encouraging for this class. I think our next, our next uh, speaker will probably be finding a lot of popularity in this room as well. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Rishi Sunak. towards energy caps of 3,500, maybe 5, 6,000 in April, whatever it takes, you will provide the cash. Yes, I've always said that, John. And that's because the right thing in these circumstances is, as I said, for a compassionate Conservative government to meet the needs of the most vulnerable in our society, and that's what I would do as Prime Minister. Now, how are we going to do that? As I said, I want to cut VAT off energy bills, because that will provide some support to everybody. Uh, on top of what I announced as Chancellor. But there are two groups of people for whom I think we will need to go further. That's for those on the lowest incomes and pensioners. Now, my view is that the right way to help those people is to provide them with direct financial assistance over the autumn and winter. And Liz's view, as you probably discussed and I hope you did, is very different, right? And this is a good point of debate in this context, why these, these hustings are a good, a good forum. Because Liz's view is that which ruled out providing direct support and thinks the tax cuts are the answer. Now, the tax cut that she's proposing for someone on her salary is worth about £1,700. Right? That's pretty hefty. For someone working very hard on the national living wage, that tax cut is worth barely a pound a week. For a pensioner who's not working, and there are millions of those who are very anxious that winter, that tax cut is worth precisely zero. 
Now, I think if we carry on with that plan, if I don't win this and that's the plan that we carry on with as a party, millions of people are going to face the risk of destitution this winter. Literally millions. And if we don't do anything to avert that, I think it will be a moral failure of the Conservative government, and I don't think the British people will ever forgive us. And if I'm Prime Minister, I will not let that happen. With a very recent memory, you opposed passing VAC on energy bills, and then you changed your mind on, on that. Why did you do that, you, sir? Was it that you, some of you came rather more desperate to win the support of people like this, Conservative Party members? It's because, as you said in your opening, John, the situation has deteriorated since I was Chancellor and announced support. And I'm perfectly open and blunt about it. That cutting VAT is not the most perfect way to do things. It definitely has drawbacks. But you have to deal with the world as it is. If I become Prime Minister in a couple of weeks' time and bills go up in just a few weeks after that, there aren't that many levers that you can pull that deliver support to almost everybody in the country, which is what you would need to do, that will actually work. Now, I've been there. I've done the job, right? I've sat there and figured out how you do this. It is one of the few levers that a Prime Minister has available to them that I know will 100% certainty get cash to people quickly. Is it perfect? No. But I'm not going to let perfect be the enemy of the good. I'm going to deal with the practical reality of the situation. So I don't make any apology for going further than I said before. I want to make sure we help people, and that is a realistic, practical way to do it. And I think it's one that will make a difference to people in a few weeks' time. It is, one of the, it is one, as you say, one of the defining arguments of this leadership contest. You are against unfunded tax cuts in principle, not just as a matter of economic theory, which is, of course, I guess, why you said yesterday, clearly, I guess, as you could, that you could not serve in a list of trust cabinets. No, I, I mean, what, what I was saying is I'm not focused on those things at the moment, John. What I'm focused you said, on doing... You said you had a yeah, period well, well, of being honest with you. Yeah. We weren't going to do I was, that I, was reflect, I was reflecting on the last couple of years and, and, and actually having been in Canada. I'm one of these people who, maybe it's old-fashioned actually, in the last few weeks I, I've discovered quite how old-fashioned it is. My general view is, if you're in a cabinet, while you're in it, uh, uh, you, you defend all the decisions in it. That's what collective responsibility means. And I take that seriously. I know it seems a bit quaint these days. So, but, uh, but, so, and I'm fed on you, and that's important. But look, you're right. I, I don't believe in unfunded tax cuts. And you know, there's been a lot of talk in this leadership election about Margaret Thatcher and you know and rightly so because she's our greatest post-war prime minister. But I reflect on it and I think well what you know what actually was Margaret Thatcher's most important legacy? Why is it that she's so revered? Now you could say well it's because she took on the unions, because of her economic reforms, because she spread home ownership far and wide. Now all those things were important but I don't actually think that's why she's revered. I think it's because of her character. And she was prepared always to take difficult decisions. She was prepared to say the things that might be difficult that the country needed to hear. She wasn't prepared ever to make a promise that she couldn't keep. That's what I think Margaret Thatcher was about. And that's a standard that I hold myself to. And I think unfunded tax cuts are wrong. And you know what? Her Chancellor, Nigel Lawson, agrees with me. The head of her policy unit agrees with me. Norman Lamont agrees with me. All these people who understood Margaret Thatcher's economics are supporting my economic plan because it, it's the right one for our country and it's a conservative approach for managing the economy and that's what our party stands for. So it's a, it's a, it's a question of principle which you, which you say you will stand by. You put that above any question of serving in a, in a cabinet, a red box, a ministerial card, all of the, the rest of it. Now, when the sun comes, there would have to be votes in the House of Commons on that. There'd have to be a finance bill. And those votes are wit. Three line wits. Dissent is not tolerated. You wouldn't serve in a cabinet uh, and defend those policies. Would you vote for them? I think, I think John, you, you're going into all these hypotheticals about may or may not happen. Well, because so I, that's I, that's I think what I'm focused on, though, and actually why we're all here tonight, is to figure out whose plan is the right one to take the country forward at what is a really difficult time. 
And I'm going to spend every minute I've got tonight talking to the you know, 1,500 people that are here, as I'm doing every day, five or six times a day, talking to our members across the country, because you're acting like this is already over, and it's not. I'm going to fight hard for every vote, and I'm going to keep talking. <laughs> I don't suggest that it's over. I think these are, I suggest, questions of character to you. Let me put a question to you, which is on the minds of very many people today crying in the eyes of the, the awful news story that I mentioned earlier on, the eight-year-old child in Liverpool, gunned down by gunmen who forced their way into the family flat. Your thoughts on that and in the context of the need demand for more police officers that are being proposed now. Make, oh, the numbers we've seen so far, as you know, make up the cuts from the austerity years. What would you do in office? Yeah, I, uh, I mean, I, already, I read about it earlier this evening. Yeah. Shocking. Uh, Olivia, I think uh, her name was. I actually thought she was, she was nine. She was the same age as my younger daughter. Um, and it's horrific. I mean, I, I'm a sort of parent, grandparents here. Yeah. And I read it and I was, you know, I caught, I caught my wife. And, and spoke to my daughter, actually, is what I did when I found out about it earlier on uh, today. Um, and my, my heart goes out to our family, as I'm sure it does from everybody here tonight, uh, about grappling with a loss like that. You know, what, you know, what can we do uh, you know, in government to try and prevent things like that from happening? Yes, it's about putting more police officers on the street, and we've got a plan to do that. But it's also making sure that, well, I, I mean, at the moment, we need to finish putting 20,000 more on the streets. But I think, actually, we need to make sure that they're focused on the right things, and that we're using their time effectively, and we're using the best techniques that are available to policing, and I mentioned it in my, my remarks earlier, I think actually when I talk to people involved in fighting crime, when I talk to our police and crime commissioners and our councillors everywhere, you know, what's clear is that there are things that hold us back from getting to grips with crime in our country, and a couple of examples, you know, one is stop and search, which is a very effective policing tool. Now, you know, our, our conservative police and crime commissioners understand that. They want to use it. We just came from the hustings in Manchester where, you know, Andy Byrne, the Labour Mayor, has got a police force that's been in special measures and, is, and I want to actually provide police forces like that with the powers to use stop and search at similarly I mentioned grooming gangs. And, you know, I think it's another thing that has affected young children as young as uh, Olivia and my daughters for too long. It's very pervasive in our country and if I'm fortunate to win this, I want to do something to tackle that pernicious crime. And as I said earlier, I will never let political correctness stand in the way of keeping our country safe. That's kind of the But let's look at another practical, as it were, proposal from you to deal with that, also help another hard press public service, the health service. It is one of your big ideas, isn't it, to, uh, to, to charge patients' penalties when they fail to attend for their medical appointments. So let me put it to you for the sake of, of, the, of the discussion. That's, that's a gimmick. Who will enforce these penalties? Are you proposing county court actions in pursuit of £10, £12 penalties? Are you asking GPs to deny them to people who can't or won't pay this penalty? How does it make sense? So, you, what, you, John, what you describe as a gimmick, I completely and utterly disagree with, right? Now, we will, we will, as Conservatives, know that we don't measure our success by how much money we throw at things. And if we want to be able to credibly cut taxes, and I do, I want to cut all your taxes. But there is no one who can sit here and credibly tell you that they're going to cut your taxes responsibly unless they've also got a plan to reform the NHS to make it more efficient. Because if we don't, if we don't, it will continue to bubble up every single pound that everyone has. Right? And it's not enough just to, to say that and say, oh gosh, yes, oh, there's too many bureaucrats in the NHS, everyone will clap, great. Like, we need some practical solutions, right? So, yes, this is one, because you know what? 15 million appointments last year missed. Not, not, not just the GPs, but let's just do, let's talk about why this is a prize, first of all, to go after. Not just the GPs, but hospital doctors too. 15 million. Right? That's not right. Doesn't value our doctors. Deprives people of the care they need. And if we can get this right, it's not about making money from charging, it's about changing the culture in this country so it's not acceptable. Right? Now, if we get it right, if people cancel those appointments in advance, then we free up tons of extra health care and, and we will get the backlogs down quicker. So you know what? Right. So, you know what? I was a person who set up furlough in a matter of weeks, 
right? When everyone said to me, well, how will you do this? How will this work? We know, a, we don't even know what the word means, let alone how we're going to administer a system <laughs> that, that, that is going to actually make sure we pay the wages of 10 million people. And every single newspaper, they told me afterwards, had kept space that day to write the story that the system would never work. And it did, because that's what I do, John. When they come across difficult problems, I get to grips with them, and I solve them. That's what I do. <laughs> Well, that's a cool example of the last section of the audience. I'm not yet convinced we'll go down quite as well with GPs, but we leave well, that to the I've been across the country and I've had enormous support for it. Why do you think, how, how bet lots of you here, when you go to a GP surgery, don't they, lots of them have signs up now, don't they? They all have signs up and they tell you how many people missed an appointment last week, last month, because they don't want people to miss appointments because it's not valuing their time. Right. Um, just a question then from one of our uh, listeners. His name is William Arsenal. And he's asking why there's more focus on standards of, of conduct. In a word, would your government be more honest than the one that we have? Yes. That's why I left the government, John. Because it wasn't. <laughs> would, you, uh, would, would, you then, therefore, would you therefore appoint, as this Committee on Standards in Public Life urges, would you appoint an ethics advisor yeah. to number 10 with the power to initiate investigations whether you want them or not? Yeah, I've said already very clearly that I would reappoint the independent advisor on ethics, yeah, and I would make sure that they have the powers and responsibilities to hold people to account. But look, I, obviously it gets set by the leader, and I would set an example. But I talked earlier about appealing to swing voters, so I think this is really important. Now, now if we're going to win that election, right, we're going to appeal to all these swing voters that we need to. <clears throat> Remember, they're not, they're not Tories, right, every day. They're not Labour people. They're swing voters, so they're not ideological. What do they want? They want a government that works properly, right? That's what those people want. And my view is, we need to appeal to them. So I'm going to run a government where things are conducted seriously, where they're conducted competently, with decency and integrity at the heart of everything that we do. That is the change that I'm going to bring. That's the Prime Minister that I'm going to be, and that's how we're going to restore standards and win the next election. <laughs> We're going to open questions to the floor. But a couple, last question from our, one of our listeners, his name is Clarissa. Would you seek to change the system of electing leaders of the Conservative Party? Or would you leave them as they are? I don't know how your answer might go down with this. Let's find out. <laughs> Looking nervously at the chair and having all our great volunteers. No, no, I, I think, as, actually, I think we've, we've said anyway, actually, I think after all these processes, it's worth people sitting down and figuring out what worked, what didn't work, talk to all of you uh, about whether how it worked for you. I think that's a, a totally reasonable thing to do. But I think I should go further than that, because I've, we talk a lot in all these things about what you know I want to do for the country, but I also care about all of you. And if you've got five minutes tonight, if you're interested, online somewhere, there is my contract with members, uh, because I think all of you are amazing, right? I'm only here because of the support of my association, my activists, my volunteers, my councillors, and we owe all of you an extraordinary debt. So with my contract for members, I've set out a few things that I want to do to support all of you. I'll give you two things just to, to throw it out there. But one of them, I, I really, uh, talking to Andrew about this, I want to regularly make sure we have surveys of what you think. I shouldn't have to go to Con Home and see what you think. I want to know what you think directly. And, and more than that, more than that, what I want to say is, what I, what I will commit to you is we're going to have these regular surveys and then those top issues are they going to get actually discussed at our political cabinets so that you can join this party one week, you can feel in your ideas the next week and know that it's going to be discussed by the people at the top the week after that because that's how a party like ours should work. And the other thing I want to do, because we talked about winning that election, is I want to raise more money for this party than we've raised before, specifically to put fully paid campaign managers in all our target seats, because that's the support that we need to bring. <laughs> um, let's, see. let's start with you, sir. Three votes. Good evening, uh, John. Good evening, Richard. Good evening. Um, when we have a crisis of any sort in this country, whether it's for us or anybody else, we normally appoint a task force. We have a, a serious crisis going on with energy supplies and everything else. Would you appoint a task force to immediately, if you become the Prime Minister, and actually see what they come up with and um, put it into action? Yes, and you're right. I mean. 
This task force approach has served us well, notably with the vaccine, actually, and the Prime Minister deserves enormous credit for assembling that task force, empowering them, and people like Kate, Kate Bingham. They did an extraordinary job, and I think all of us here feel very proud of that. So, look, what, what does that mean for energy? Well, it means, it means a few things that we need to get right. I'll give you a few things. Not only, of course, we need to provide short-term support for people, look, but that's only short-term. We need to make sure we don't have to deal with this problem again. So we need better energy security here at home, reduce our energy dependence. So I want to absolutely turbocharge our program of energy efficiency. Because at the moment there are millions of homes that could benefit from loft insulation, cavity wall insulation, smart controls. We've got a government set of money to do that, but it's not working properly. And if we can do that, we can save people £400 off their bills and reduce our energy need. We also need to create an innovation economy that's going to, not a million miles away from here, create the small modular reactors that can power all our homes much more cheaply and cleanly. We need to find new forms of energy storage to make sure that next year we don't have to deal with this problem. And lastly, we have to reform our energy market. Now, what I've been very clear about is that we're all paying far too much for our electricity at the moment for reasons that we haven't addressed. Because the electricity providers get to charge us a very high price based on what's going on in the natural gas markets. That's wrong. I would change it. They've done it in lots of European countries. We're behind and as Prime Minister I fix it so that you and all the businesses can get cheaper electricity as soon as possible because that's what our country needs. We <laughs> lady over here, two rows from the... From the different firm, but the lady... Mm -hmm. right. So a subject that hasn't come up so far HS2 is having a devastating effect in Staffordshire and he, um, Andrew Stevenson's actually been to our farm. I know farmers that have, got, have no income whatsoever, they've had land compulsory purchase and yet they're not getting paid. They're getting no money. We've been waiting years for money to build a new house. We're getting nothing. What are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about the effect on Staffordshire? And have you read out in the billions it's costing this country? Well, Alan, I'm sorry to hear about your situation and I'd be happy to talk to you after to make sure we get your situation resolved as quickly as possible. Look, on, on HS2, uh, in fact, that was a, a more negative reception about HS2 than I expected, given where we are tonight. But, look, I, I, in general, I, look, I'm not going to be able to tell you right now I can cancel that project. I'm not going to do that. So we are where we are at the moment. Now, what I can tell you, though, is, and this actually goes to your question, is the, the company, and Andrew will know as well, the company HS2 Limited that is in charge of this needs to be held to very firm account. Um, and that is something that I do. And it's not just, it's about making sure that people like you are treated fairly, but it's also, in general, making sure that disruption on communities is absolutely minimised. And whether it's actually, you know, down, down in the south, uh, in Buckinghamshire, where I was earlier last week, or, or up here in Staffordshire, we need to make sure that as it's being built, it's being built in a way that brings people uh, along with them and they deliver all the commitments that they have made, which clearly, as far as I can tell, is not happening. And I will fix that as Prime Minister, because that's not right, it's not fair, and we need to make sure that we correct it. Mr. Sinat, thank you for joining us here today. So given the current um, cost of living crisis and Russia's part to play in that, I was wondering how are you going to tackle our reliance on China? Great, that's a great question. Uh, so so look, Ch China represents, I believe, the Chinese Communist Party, represent the biggest threat to our economic security and thereby our national security out of any state in the country, right? So that's a straightforward fact. That's also what the head of MI5 or the FBI recently said in, a, in the joint speech that they gave. So what does that mean for us? Well, it means we need to do a few things. Uh, we need to be robust in standing up for our values uh, and our interests. So it means supporting people in Hong Kong, as we so brilliantly did recently. It means a defence partnership with Australia and America and putting our aircraft carrier in the region to show that we care about our allies over there. And it means what I did as Chancellor, passing a new law 
that allows us to block investment from hostile foreign actors that are trying to infiltrate our companies and steal our technology. And as Prime Minister, I would use those powers that I passed as Chancellor to make sure that we protect ourselves. And the last thing I'd say is we've got to be thinking about the future threats. Right now, we are here in one of the most amazing automotive manufacturing parts of our country, and over time we're going to transition to electric vehicles. That will be great for net zero, create lots of jobs, uh, and save us money. But no good us doing that if it turns out that all the rare earth minerals going into those batteries all come from China. So that's why I started doing this chancellor was working with our allies like Australia, Canada, and America to build up a supply chain. So exactly as you said, means that we are not reliant on China in years to come for things that are really important to this country. That's the type of thinking that I think your Prime Minister needs to have, and that's the type of approach to China that I want. There's really no question in the respect of the British response in support of Ukraine. If it came to the point of a threat, a physical threat, a military threat on the part of uh, China towards Taiwan, what should Britain's response be to that? I wouldn't change our current policy on that position at all. So I think our policy vis-a-vis Taiwan is the right one, as it speaks today. In, in concrete terms, what would you do for Sanctions, military support? The, the best thing we can do to prevent aggression for, against Taiwan from China is showing Russia that they will not be successful in Ukraine. That is the absolute best thing we can do, and that's why we must have to do it. leave it here. trying to uh, get a conservative gain. So we do a lot of knocking on doors and a lot of people keep telling us, uh, when are we, we going to sort out all the immigration, the illegal immigration coming in? So what would you do? Yes, great question. So I, I, you know, I mentioned it earlier. Look, I, look, as I said, look, we, we should never lose sight of the fact that our country has this unbelievable capacity for compassion in welcoming people from around the world. My family are a beneficiary of that. Many others here tonight would have also been. And we've demonstrated it in Hong Kong, in Ukraine, in Afghanistan, and in Syria. But when people are coming here illegally, it undermines trust in the system we've got to grip it. So we have to be radical about it. We have to be bold. If you've got five minutes tonight, alongside my contract for members thing, there's a 10-point plan on this that I've put out, because I think it is genuinely one of the big emergencies facing our countries. There's a, and you can read about it here. I'll give you one or two specific bits of the 10-point plan to give you an illustration why I want to be different about this. The first is, I want to move away from the European definition of asylum, because it is too broad, and it allows far too many people to explore. That's the second, second thing, and the second out of ten, is we've got to get tougher with our foreign policy. So right now, we have this situation, which is extraordinary, that we will go to a country, we'll talk to them about a trade deal we want to do, we'll also give them foreign aid, right, to help their country, but at the same time, we, we are not asking them, or requesting them, or demanding that they also take back their failed asylum seekers. Right? That's wrong, and we've got to change that as well. On that, you have taken a pretty strong line on this matter. You said that, that countries that refuse to take back the horses from this country could pay a price in terms of aid, aid payments. This country has, as you know, a proud record of supporting countries and peoples in need especially and including humanitarian aid for emergencies around the world. Are you saying that aid would be in question in the course of a dispute of this kind? But as I said specifically, there's a difference between humanitarian emergencies, which of course we're always going to be responsive to, but then situations where we have ongoing aid programs in countries which we've had for years, and at the same time, that country is not taking back its failed asylum seekers. But I think that is a practical, common-sense approach to this problem, and it's one that the vast majority of the British people will absolutely support, and we should not be shy about pursuing a policy like that. That's good. And you're not, you're not simply going to have it go through. You're not saying it's possible to deprive a country of aid with, uh, with, with no human cost. There is always going to be more need for our aid budget than, than we can provide, right? That's just a fact, sad fact, but that's the reality of it. So when we're choosing where to provide aid, who to provide it to, I think it is, it's not my money, it's all your money, it's the country's money. I think it's entirely reasonable that if we're thinking about where we can do that, we do it with countries that are happy to help us and take back their fellow asylum seekers. That seems entirely logical and common sense to me, and I genuinely believe the vast majority of the British public will be quite surprised to find out that we don't do that already, quite frankly. 
so as everyone in this room should know, we're the Conservative and Unionist Party. So what will you do if you're an anti minister to follow on from the amazing work that Liz Truss has done around the strip, like sorting the Northern Ireland protocol out and making sure that Northern Ireland stays part of the union? Yes, so I'm going to actually just carry on uh, with the policy that we've got in place. So we have a bit in Parliament that uh, you all know about, I would carry that on. And you're right in the sense that Northern Ireland's economy is being dragged out of the orbit of the UK, and that's wrong. And as Prime Minister, I want to fix that, and the bill gives us the ability to do that uh, if we can't get a negotiated settlement. Now, the other part of the union we need to worry about is obviously Scotland. Uh, which you didn't mention, but I think we might as well talk about it for a second, uh, because it's really important. And there I think we need to do a few things. I think the first thing is we've got to more actively demonstrate the benefit of the union in Scotland. And that's something that I started doing as Chancellor. Actually, not, you know, the civil service are all very upset, but I said, hang on, we're going to actually now start investing directly in Scottish communities. From, you know, we're going to talk to them directly and not have everything just go to the SNP government because we believe in genuine devolution, that's really working, and we need to do more of that. The second thing we need to do is remember that when it comes to the union in Scotland, who are we talking to? We're not talking to Tories. They're all fine. We need to talk to the third of the people in Scotland who do not vote Conservative, and are never likely to, but are unionists, right? And you need a leader who you think can actually talk to those people, right? And I believe that I can. And the last thing is probably the most important. When it comes to arguing for the union, it's easy to think about, well, this, what about, what, you know, maybe the argument about borrowing, how will Scotland manage, what about their currency, who's going to pay their pensions, what about trade, but those are all important arguments. But we have to remember, nationalism is very seductive. It's a romantic idea, and we have to fight that idea with an argument that speaks to people's hearts. And my grandparents emigrated here, not to England, they emigrated to the United Kingdom, and it wasn't geography for them. It represented a set of values. And we have to make an argument about the union that is based on those shared values that speaks to people's hearts. And that's what I will do as Prime Minister. Yes, we have definitely started this question by asking about the Northern Ireland yes. approval bill. I'm going to ask you, would you pursue that bill? You'll say yes. So we ask you, yes. indeed you have. I'm going to ask you, uh, will you push it through Parliament using the Parliament Act? I've no doubt that you would. Would a trade war with the European Union, because at the moment, the European Union, London are at loggerheads. Would a trade war, trade war at a time of recession be a price worth paying for making your point to Parliament? So, uh, but you said rightly, Tom, that the, the relationship is at loggerheads. I, and I think, actually, you know, think about this. With a new Prime Minister, we have a chance to reset that relationship. Because it's clear that it's not in the best of places, both with France, the EU, with Ireland. Now, I believe that as a new Prime Minister, I will have an opportunity to reset that relationship. I have very good relations with all my counterparts in those places and have been actually managed to get agreements with them, whether it's on sanctions policy against Russia or indeed on global tax policy, uh, that shows that I can constructively find solutions to things. So I'll, I would like to bring that to the table, because if we can do that and reach a negotiated solution, it will be far quicker in resolving the problems in Northern Ireland than waiting for the Parliament Act, which, if necessary, of course I will do, but will take time. So I would like to also try and pursue a negotiated settlement, and I think as a new Prime Minister, there's an opening to try and do so. She wants, of course, a negotiated settlement. Any other answer would surely be irresponsible. But there is a danger of a final trade economic conflict. Would that be a price worth paying? Sure. I know mean, we're running out of time. I'm going to take one more question on your questions. But look, what are we talking about here? Yeah. Uh, what, what we're talking about here is that if you're, if you're a grandparent at the moment, you can't send a present to your granddaughter in Northern Ireland from GB without filling out a lot of forms. If you want to go camping, you can't take your dog on holiday, right? Or if you're a British supermarket, it's like, hang on, I can't sell my sandwiches in every part of the United Kingdom. Those are the kind of practical things we're talking about. No one needs to have a trade war to resolve practical things like that. That's completely ridiculous. And we can find a solution that doesn't work. Let's go over, over here to this side. Three rows, four rows back. Gentleman with his arm um, yeah, with his bullet shirt. Can we go up? Right, a lady here waiting for this. Do that first. Um, hi. So we've talked a lot over the last month or so about employment, and there are lots of professional sectors in the UK that we struggle to find you know, staff for social workers, speech and language therapists, occupational therapists. 
all professions that are highly skilled and have a real impact on the health and safety of our children and young people, what are you going to do to improve recruitment in those sectors? <coughs> Well, good question to end on. And so, look, many of you here will have businesses. And I'm sure if I ask you what's the number one challenge you have, other than energy bills, I'm sure lots of you would say it's getting workers, right? And that is, we all know, it's lots of nodding, right? The thing that's holding our economy back and is causing inflation at the moment is a lack of people in the workforce. So I think we need to do a couple of things. And your question more broadly, right? The first thing I want to do is actually tackle our welfare system and tighten it up. Because right now, I'll tell you this, there are more people claiming unemployment benefit than there are job vacancies in the economy, right? Think about that. That is wrong, and it's certainly wrong under a Conservative government. So I want to make sure that we tighten up our welfare system, support people off benefits and into work, because that's good for them, good for their families, good for the taxpayer, but also good for the economy and will ease inflationary pressures. And it's exactly what a Conservative government should be doing. Right. Second, thing. Se second thing is obviously training and skills. And you mentioned social care. That one of the things that I was proud to do, even though it was difficult, was create a new way to fund the NHS and social care. And part of that money is going to go to the social care workforce because they don't feel appreciated or valued enough, and that's why lots of them leave and we have high turnover. With the money, we're going to create career pathways, new certification, training, qualifications, which will give a real sense of career progression, and I know will mean that people stay in the industry, are more fulfilled, will get better care, and will help with all the recruitment issues. And then the last thing we need to do is be pragmatic on migration. Right now, I proudly voted for Brexit. Right? And Brexit, for me, was about control of our borders. It wasn't saying that no one should ever come here. Right? So if we are tackling illegal migration, and the lady's question, we're doing that. If we are being tough on the welfare system and getting people off that and into work, then I'm entirely pragmatic about using migration where we need to to support our public services or the economy. And I think many of us who voted for Brexit will be comfortable with that as long as we're doing those other things. And that's the approach that I will take to that problem. Rishi is aching to be asked a no, question. No, no, you, no, there's not been a single question about tax. And I'm shocked. I'm literally shocked. It's probably the only hustings where we have not talked about tax. <laughs> at, the, at the very, very top. I asked you about VAT, which was one of the, the tax policies, one yes, of your signature. Not, yes. no, I accept your apology, Rishi. It's perfectly, perfectly fine. <laughs> <laughs> Corporation tax. I, want to, I like to leave people happy. We'll talk about corporation tax. Give me your thoughts on your line on corporation tax. Um, well, look, we're talking about big companies, aren't we? Rather than small. Right. So that many of you uh, would have heard that I want to put up corporation tax, and I'm sure when Liz was here and she said she would scrap that, and you all probably clapped, and that's fine. But let me explain why those of you that are clapping are, in my view, wrong. Right? Let me explain what is happening. So, yes, corporation tax is going to go up next year. But why is it going up? Well, it's going up in part because of what I said. Because, like Margaret Thatcher and Nigel Lawson, I believe it's not right to have excessive borrowing. Right? I don't think it's right to spend money on public services and not pay for it and ask our kids and our grandkids to pick up the tap. Right? I don't think that's a moral thing to do. It's certainly not a responsible thing to do. So, but three things you need to know. Three things about this that you need to know. Right? Number one, we will still, after this increase, have the lowest corporation tax rate in the G7, so the large economies that we compete against. America, Canada, Germany, France, Italy, Japan, will have the lowest. Broaden it out to the 20 largest economies in the world that we compete against, we're going to have the fourth lowest rate. So point number one, this is an internationally very low rate, no one can say otherwise, right? Point number two, this only applies to the largest businesses. 70% of UK registered companies won't pay the increased rate, they're exempt, they're going to pay a small profits rate because I want to support small businesses. My mum ran a small business, I know what it's like, and we are the party of small businesses. So that's point number two, right? <laughs> point number three. Now, point number three, and this is the most important point, right? This is the most important point. I'm going to combine that increase with significant tax reforms and tax cuts to other bits of our corporate tax system. So for those businesses that are invested so imagine that manufacturing plant that's expanding, putting in an extra line, putting in some new robotics to increase the productivity of its output. 
That we have big tax cut for. Imagine another business, not a million miles away from here, that's investing in R&D to create a new small modular reactor that's going to provide clean energy for us at affordable prices or anything else. That business also is going to get a tax cut on, on R&D. Why? Because those are the areas where we fall behind all our other countries. When you say, why is our productivity lower? Why is our growth not as high? It's because our businesses are not investing as much. They're not innovating as much. I've studied this problem, I've talked to a million people, I've got a career in business, and I know what will work. And if we deliver these tax cuts, because I'm a conservative like you, I want to cut taxes, and I think tax cuts can drive growth, but only if we cut the right ones. And with my plan, we will actually get the outcome we want. If we go with Liz's plan and stick with what we've done for the last 10 years, nothing's going to change. Investment in this country today, no higher than it was a decade ago. We've got to try something different. My plan is a better plan, and I'm 100% convinced that if you give me this job and we deliver this tax plan, we will have a faster growing, higher productivity economy that is creating jobs everywhere, but especially here in England. policy, tax between the two sides, the two candidates in this, in this race to be our next, next Prime Minister. We've made some progress, I think, in, in learning a few things that perhaps we haven't learned until this moment. We shall see. There are two weeks still to go. It is still not over. A lot of people still to vote, even though a lot of you seem to have done so. For now, this evening, let's hope you found that. And listeners at Two Times Radio at home found that a useful exercise as well. Thanks to our candidates. Thanks. The US, when they borrow money, they're getting it in 1.5, 1.9 interest rate. Africans, when they get the same amount of money, they're paying 9, 10%. The people who don't need a break, they get a break. The ones who need a break, they don't get a break. The sheer survival of the World Bank IMF is based on the fact that African countries and, and many other developing countries do not succeed. Their success is based on our failure. That has to change. And guess who can make that change? We, the children of Africa, we, the Africans, are the ones who have to say, we know your game now. Enough is enough. We're not playing it anymore. And this is where the diaspora come in. There are more Ghanaian doctors in New York City than in, in the entire country of Ghana. There are more doc Nigerian doctors in LA than in the entire country of Nigeria. So let's be serious here. What Africa needs is capacity, capacity, capacity. And that capacity is in the diaspora. So it behooves us to bring the diaspora together. Let them understand what is really going on in our Africa. Diaspora are not going home. Diaspora are angry about Africa because they are not understanding the root cause of why Africa is where it is today. They think getting rid of a president will take care of the problem. Far from it. That president is just going to be replaced by another one who is going to equally suffer from the same difficult environment to work in. So let's look at an Africa that must be free to take care of herself, an Africa that's free from exploitation from outsiders. The multinationals who are stealing from Africa every day in broad daylight. I use an example of the DRC. If you ever fly very low over the DRC, you'll see tarmacs in the jungle. You'll see 747s flying into DRC, picking up minerals and flying right out. The same multinationals are responsible for arming young people and giving them MK16s. Because why? Their satellites in the skies are telling them where that village is. There's, there are lots of diamonds. So what do they do? Arm young people, drag them up, and send them to go chop off a few heads. The rest of the village runs away, so they come behind and do their illegal mining. We black people must understand what is really going on. Because what we are shown instead is, oh, look at those Africans killing each other. There are some serious games that have been played in Africa for far too long. And once we understand that, we can strategize as to how we can begin to bring the difference and bring the change that Africa needs. And that change can only come if the African diaspora are united and the Wakanda villages, as I call them. It is our organized way of saying, starting with one African diaspora center of excellence, it will be a new city, a developmental hub that we can then take from there Every sector is developed. Take healthcare. How many doctors do we need in this region to take care of this many people? 
We pick up education, same thing. We pick up engineering. We pick up electricity. How many megawatts of power do we have in the region? How many do we need? Be it solar, be it wind, be it hydro, be it geothermal, be it nuclear. We were singing, when you were singing, the masters of the field were coming. We who are boys are coming. The masters of the field are coming. We who are boys are coming. To win the race, to win the race, we trust in God, we trust in God. To win the race, we trust in God. And that's for, God. And that's for Opoku, right? Masters mm -hmm. are coming. Masters are coming. Mm -hmm. Masters are coming to win the race. Oh, oh, oh. oh. Masters are coming. And then they will sing. <laughs> <laughs> there we go more. Then we will keep quiet. Mm -hmm. Then we will sing. Uh, when they tired, they will come in. Mm -hmm. Diplo, Owens. Diplo, Owens are winning again. We have to win the race and take a cup. We are the masters of the field and best athletes, famous to all and decent boys. How would you prove? Then they will start. I've been quiet. 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 One dollar, one CD. In the time of Mills and Mahama, two CDs, one dollar. If I was them, I would say to the people of Ghana, I'm sorry. We are sorry for the poor work we have done. We're going to go and think about ourselves. But that is not the people we're dealing with. The fruits of office, the money, the money under the table has become sweet for them. So they are determined to stay. Are we going to allow that to happen? Are we going to allow that to happen? In Kufo's time, one of the people who advised and helped him develop a strong CD was my running mate, Mohamedou Baumia. Then he was deputy governor of the Bank of Ghana. It's one of the reasons I brought him to come and join me, that we will work on the CD and create again a strong CD that will be able to allow us to develop our economy and allow our traders and our work to be able to develop. We have told the world, we have told the world that under our leadership, we're going to turn our back on the old economy, the raw material exporting economy, and build a new industrial value-adding economy in our country that will bring jobs for our people and for especially for the young people of our country. That is the goal of the new NPP government and the administration and the national government. A competitive labor force because we're going to give all the children of our country an opportunity. Hello, I'm going to Kofi Kranteini. Nane, Ilevi, 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 Kasana, Yakasagana, Ubiarika, Ilevi, Inti, Say, say, me, ti, bing, me. Ni, Ilevi. Because Ilevi problem, no, e, ye, simple. Na, Ghana government is on person, or Tiasi, Inti, ne, ye, be, chile, mwa, chile, no, wa, Tiasi, ye. E, I'm going 2020 IMF ma Ghana 1 billion dollars billion with a b same year no world bank ma Ghana 430 million dollars nina for covid e we you know in 2021 no IMF sam ma Ghana 1 billion dollars bill 1 billion with a b now, World Bank Sama Ghana, 130 million dollars. In 2021, no, so one billion, 130 million, yeah, if he World Bank buy any IMF buy, no. Now, we say post COVID rejuvenation program, say, what be my young economy, no, so into no, World Bank, the IMF, this is Ghana, Ghana. Ghana government core Bank of Ghana, Koyi. 20 billion cities say COVID in tea. 
na busuafo bo ban kama mu 2 billion uh, i am a farmer mu 2 billion bo ban kama mu 560 million dollars for covid i know an som mu san call bank of ghana ko yi 20 billion cedis say covid in ti say sika no wo mu hu konta nkyere yen ye ana wo abu wo mu ye be bia wo be fa wo ghana e levy tax wo ko ports a e levy wo ko airport wo ko hotels be bo dia totu bri biara so wo ghana e levy e levy e levy say sika no he na afa petrol e levy wo ko union ma port e levy say sika no he na afa na inti se ne government e peso o kire yen se Ghana fu ebi a ya dwene ne nya dwuma nti na ode sa e levy ne reba ya so ya pese ya kire government se enye se ya dwene nya dwuma o ye hu na ekoso no ne ye gai ama no if you say wo pese wu nya e levy yen ye ye responsible citizens yen pese ye ye eh ye ye stand by yet dina hoke ka ye train fire ho ono an ka se ye say responsible citizens right into your responsible citizens. Na na tini se, se wo pe se wo fwe sika, na wo di ye bribia, because yen credit rating record former, enye yen abrabo na wo di ye levi ba abe toso. Adenti, because there is over three, almost three billion Ghana cities a record to the presidency. Three billion Ghana. In it was so by 75%. What was so by 75%? I will say by $375 million. $375 million. Save and not at the presidency. You don't need 3 billion Ghana cities going to the presidency. Then now what are you Mr. Kufuado. And the Kosso war presidency. Then now what is the presidency? What is the presidency? What is the presidency? What is the presidency? Legislature, le Ghana legislators, you yeah, have well, 275 legislators. Then, as our legislators know, what you have Ghana? Say, say, minimum, can say, hey, Ghana, if we, you bet me, Afa, I install it, Watson, IBM computer, our friend is Watson, no, ah, hey, artificial intelligence, ah, hey, hey, over 90% of young parliamentarians, no. You bet me a replace one with Watson. Watson computer by one juma. Na yen downscale. I then ye here two hundred and seventy five parliamentarians out. Then we ye magana. One liability to Ghanaians na ye over hundred thousand cities every month per parliamentarian. Hundred thousand cities. Kona kubun kunta na he. Enuechi. What was judiciary? Judiciary he. America ye three hundred and thirty million people. 11 times the size of Ghana. Ghana is 30.8 million. America were nine Supreme Court judges. A Kufuado Bana saying Ghana near were 10 Supreme Court judges. A Kufuado are 28. I can't. In this say Ghana, 30, a country of less than 31 million people, no, yeah, were 18 Supreme Court judges. Ding, ne, how young? 18. Then na aren't young na just a cronger will be as in a gun and a won't see Supreme Court judges. Then tin ye were Supreme Court judges. A country of less than 31 million. 18 Supreme Court judges. Ka ka one Supreme Court judge be no liability every hundred and fifty thousand dollars, hundred and fifty thousand cities a month. Kona kubun kunta ne V8 ordered them ne bodyguards ne ne driver ne 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 krone ba den inti ne ya fa an extra eight supreme court judges and no kwanchen say say amene mo ka say ye wo 34 eh eh wo friending ambassadorial post around the world 34 vatican city ah e wo room kra ye wo ambassador wo ho den na ambassador wo vatican city ye magana mo kan kire ye nge Adeng ni ewo ambassadors wo bebi ti se Malta nom ni wo friend den Sri Lanka se Sudan nom ni ade. Den o komo na yeni ade ba inti ni ewo ambassadors wo Sudan. It doesn't make any kind of sense. Se wo re e levy. What is this? Yes, I wo 58 diplomatic missions around the world. Diplomatic mission no anka hum fasone se wo wo trade deska. Eddie income commerce a Ghana. 
Sa diplomatic missions around the world, they are 50, 80. Sika beng wade bre gana. Moun kanchire ye near here. E ye krong waste of money and resource. Muse mo refe e levy. Ye betchira mo se e levy. No moun kona moun ko yi infi mo amu futum. Positions na mo kreti a hun nimfa sono. E hon na moun ko yi infi. A deng na mo hao gana fo sa a MPP fo. Deng na gana fo a ye moun ti. Na de biya yen ti a se, yen ti a se no. Sa positions yi na yi waste. He. We were over 2,000 executive positions. I were executive benefits and perks. We to come with business class. We were four by four. No money. This how many nurses were you for? And I what also? And no no be ma eleven no income from eleven. You be nye for who? Mroso mroso mroso. Then necessary you catch the kufu adu no government. So sad no. Munko yi yin for who? No na mo boka Ghana foka unnecessarily. Na mo be we yi ne we. Na excavate sa unyangu kwa adumi yense yense unko ka ni yenang na ni yenfanya sika ni yenfanta uye i levi kason mwa beka chini mwa kwa shiwe excavate s eighty five excavate sa baako ya over hundred and fifty thousand to two hundred thousand mwa sa unko shiwe na kahon na pano no wehi yezi kopo no wehi ti no wehi yano kopo no sa wa bona kahon hey ekufuado and his government why Ghana fu Yen penende empenechna ilevi no wana yezubasha wana no wa kwa free scan waza ba yen pen ina le wakwene eh yen mu ba be ku yebe jina mu dene nengse yere mpeni ekufuado and his government aden aden ose when cluelessness meets unpreparedness no MPP mfuni na ubihu ngoho yabrem we're not gonna take this we're not having this mumfa Yen pene ne impene china elevenu ye chia munko inko cut legislature munko cut executive munko cut judiciary nasi kan ambassadors any wa friending ambassadorial post any ye diplomatic missions sani ameni na mun cancel na mun reduce na mun fa computers in your hair legislature say you worth two hundred seventy five no. You bet me the drone, drone I replace you one. You here two hundred seventy-five at the maximum four per region. You here sixty-four parliamentarians. You here two hundred and eleven parliamentarians. No, where liability to Ghana at about hundred thousand cities every month. You in charge only few. Come on, enough of this nonsense. You rim, you rim. I want your word in Krasimbo. Okay. Okay. So when we are the symbol of knowledge, strength, adaptability, <laughs> energy, freedom, unity, hope, peacemaking, harmony, intelligence, Continue. power of love, strength. Said in class symbols when you are obiabra bobia ebi a boy ye na ne sign na no paper no na ye di aka and in class symbols no. Okay. Now Ghana for what na si ya unu se said ya na na do nkuwa kufwa do ebu ne mai no ye ni jeho. And see, this is the Edin symbol for failure. What? It's a free nerdico. So Edin Kras symbol, you know, spells him, you know, yeah. I can't Edin Kras symbol. The president is now a free nerdico. You know, spells him, you know, yeah. I can't Edin Kras symbol. Photo. It's an Edin Kras symbol for failure. You are failure. You are failure. And I beg you, you can never make it. Yen and Nanuma Motina see here at the Crassembos. You see Mummy and Fawin Kahu. This for the Crassembos for free. Apostle, we have this. Now back to the studio. Tell Apostle about this. This is what you want to use your life for. Oh my God. You know what? I am a boy. Wakan. When? It is a castle. Oh man, you're here, my. Hey! Then I'm a memoir and quiet. Mother. I come to you. 